Let me see if that works. Sorry guys, let's see if this works better. Some people were having problems getting into the live, so I restarted it. We're gonna get Alexia back in here. Here she comes. One moment. Are you on? Um, I'm trying to get on to mine to see you. So now this is... There you go, yeah, some people had a frozen screen, so I restarted it. Are you guys in? Are you good? Better? People who had issues, are you better? You're better? For now. All right, let's see if we can do this again. Sorry, guys. Let me restart this. You good? Everybody's thumbs up? Yeah. Okay. Let's make sure everybody's in here. All right. What happened? Oh so God. I was getting a lot of messages and Amanda actually came in here from the other room and she said that she, the screen was frozen for them. So I wanted, it actually turned off and restarted for us. So I think, is everybody good now? Is everybody in the chat? You all can see, you're good, you see, we're on. I can see all your comments. Yeah, oh, that was hilarious. If, if that had been in the room, <laughs> I just turned my Wi-Fi off, started on, I leapt over the bed, pulled the blind up a little bit. <laughs> comedy routine i'm just thank christ no one was watching me is that <laughs> well hey you are across the world so we're, we're it's a pretty far connection well it's true and we're doing very well we're doing very well <laughs> hello everyone hi guys we're back on we're back on frozen again oh no some people are freezing yeah i wonder why they're saying it's getting frozen when celia celia gets on when celia says something when celia gets on the live it it's, oh. It gets frozen. People are saying it's frozen when you get on a live. I wonder why. Unless I go Excuse live and expect you, Kiana, would you work? No. I'm worried we might have the same issue, though, that it's uh, the combined. Let me see. Can you guys, are we, can you guys hear us? I had to move to my phone. Okay. Okay. So, Mine's fine. We have 300 people in here, so two, 240. Someone just said they cry when they hear your voice. Oh, now. Too many people That's on there. And yes, it's Sunday morning here. It's true. I think the load. The, I'm amazed at the capacity. That the um. Oh, it's working. Okay, people are working. Are you on Wi-Fi? Get off a of Wi-Fi. Try that. Because mm -hmm. you're on my Wi-Fi. So if you're on my Wi-Fi and I'm streaming, <laughs> how many people are on Wi-Fi right now? I love your voices. Oh, that's nice. I suppose they're different, aren't they? I mean, I guess we don't sound like you guys. Too many people joking at once. You're that's back. Funny. There we go. What are you about? I can't even remember. Um, Boomer? Are we talking about Boomer? Beautiful Katrina. We, we were talking about L.A. You said you went to Rodeo Drive. Yes. I saw a um, Louis Vuitton shop, which was amazing. Uh, the energy there is really great. There's a very strong, positive, upbeat energy, I think, in LA. It's really busy. It's a crazy city, isn't it? It's so busy. Yeah. Um, so many people. I was a bit surprised there's not more people. You don't have as many people walking around in LA as, as we do in Australia and in Sydney. Australians love to get out and walk. We're very... Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, but I was surprised at that. A lot, most people drive, I think, in LA. But yes, it's good. Yeah, that's why there's always that traffic on that. I think it's four, is it the 405 or something? Maybe. Yeah. Tammy and I took a road trip up to Palm Springs because I was doing some research for a telly show that I'm developing, a TV series at, that's set in Palm Springs. And we had a ball, and Tam was the designated driver because she lived there. Mm -hmm. I think you've I oh, know you've unfrozen. And um, we just had a ball, but I was blown away by the amount of traffic. The traffic was incredible. Huge. Yeah. Mm. Let me see if I can. All right, uh, I'm going to go. One earlier that said, do you think that getting Boomer to kill Liz was the right thing to do? And um, do you know what? That's a really big question because it's 
kind of talked about the whole euthanasia uh, question and debate, and I I think that's a completely personal um, feel that everybody has with their own selves and their God, if they have a God, or the religion, if they have a religion. But in terms of the story of the show, I think it was the right thing for Liz because I she had... They, the writers were really clever in that they set up, she kept asking Boomer to help. Um, and Boomer was like, oh, no, 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 I don't want to know about it. Um, so I think for Liz, after that horrible stroke and having locked-in syndrome, that was really, that was it for her. And so, <clears throat> yeah, it was a really powerful choice for Boomer to do that. But I think it was the right one. Yeah, yeah we got... We got that question a lot here about how difficult was it to play that scene when she took your life? Was that yeah. the hardest scene that you had? Uh, um, wow. Yeah. Yeah, it would have been one of the hardest. It was weird. It was really weird. And Katrina and I are good mates. And, um, yeah, it was very sad. But I think she had the harder job because I just had to lie there, really. Um you know, with locked-in syndrome, it's a really debilitating, tragic situation because you're you're actually, um, uh, you know, you, you're locked in. You, you can hear and, and you're completely compass, but you can't do anything. You can't move or whatever. Um, so I just had to research that part of it. But on the day, I actually think the lion's share of that stuff landed in Katrina's lap. I think that was harder for her. And, yeah, the emotions, I mean... Just it's bloody sad, terribly sad. But I do think yeah. for the story and for Liz, it was the right thing, but really hard for Boomer. Yeah, really hard for Boomer. It was super emotional. Yeah, it was very hard to watch too. I know a lot of fans wrote that in too. That that was one of the hardest scenes for them to watch. Yeah, yep, I can understand. Uh, someone said they can't hear anything. Oh, that's a shame. What about who Frankie was when she came? Oh, yeah. The scene where Liz couldn't remember Frankie. Oh, that... heartbreaking. Oh, beautiful, Nicole. She's so gorgeous. They're all gorgeous. They're such a great bunch. Um, uh, that was really heartbreaking. Yeah, that was tough, that scene. Yeah. Awful. <laughs> Awful. She had to sort of pretend she knew her. And then it was obvious that she didn't. And Nicole's face. I mean, Nicole has those exquisite eyes that are his horses and she um the, her little face was devastating yeah it's very sad oh it's heartbreaking it is yeah you want to um, i know look it was full on wasn't it i mean it was tough <laughs> went through so much didn't she you know all the the whole season season seven she had all that stuff with the psychotic episodes and it was a very emotional roller coaster. So I think for her, the concept of dying was actually a huge release and a huge relief, you know. I think that's kind of where she was at. Yeah, good question. Who do you think Boomer will turn to for Liz, after Liz has gone for comfort? Don't know, guys. You're going to have to tune in for the next season. Yes. Yeah, Liz was put through the ringer. Mm, she was, poor darling. But, yeah, no, Boomer, it'll be tough on Booms. Very tough. And the dynamics change, but if there's one thing I know about the writers past, if you'll be in for a bloody great ride, whatever happens next season. So, yeah. yeah. Well, hey, we know how the last season ended, so we know uh, yes. they're cooking up something. That's right, for sure. And I think um, it was a full-on season because we lost Kaz as well. You know, that was really full-on as well. So tough, tough times for old uh, Wentworth in seven. Mm. Yeah, season seven was definitely a roller coaster. Yep, yep. So oh, that's another one seen in the cell when Frankie, that was, I think that was in season three. <coughs> Excuse me. That's not the coronavirus, right? <laughs> I have got up oh, and I've got a bit of a cough this morning. Um, the scene with beautiful Nicole, that was one of my faves, where little little Frankie comes into Liz. It's almost like she's asking for her forgiveness and support. And, you know, I think 
those first three seasons were really, um, really amazing because they were shot all in the one location at the, in a different place where we did the rest of the seasons. And, um, yeah, that was very emotional. It was really emotional. Hey, has the light gone dull on me? No, you're good. You're good. Um, <laughs> Looks really let dark. me see. This is, let's do, this is from Mrs. P. Fox. What was your favorite episode to film and why? <coughs> Good question. Um, there were so many, and it sounds like a cliched answer, but it's true. I can't really, there were so many favorites. I mean, I remember the one where Liz got out and was, got the chance to see her daughter. Um, I, I loved... The, um, I loved the one where Liz got out again and was hanging out with the dirty cop. What was his name? Oh, my God, I've forgotten. Beautiful Steve. Don Hester. Kaplan. Yes, look at you, Don Kaplan. How quickly we forget. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was really interesting to shoot that, for Liz to be in a different situation in court and all that. You know, I look back and Liz had some really great journeys. She had She did. I got out twice and then yeah. in twice, sadly. Um, but, you know, too many good episodes. I, I guess being an original gangster, because I was there from the start, um, there's just so much content. I have so many great memories, like truly. Oh, the steak knife. Yeah, that was fun. That was fun. <laughs> that was a good line, wasn't it? That's gone down in the... In the pages, the historical pages of Wentworth, and I believe the other one was um, when Liz is quite drunk, and she has a girl boomer and says, "You have got a fat." Well, this is from go. Sarah. There you go. Favorite Liz line from Sarah. Fine. I think it was probably the steak line, maybe, and uh, and the fat ass baby. <laughs> <laughs> That's a favorite. That is a favorite. It was lovely. I think, um, you know, it's so, there was so much joy. Even though the, the show could be really bleak, it was, um, it's very, very joyful because the cast are gorgeous. They're all so lovely. And um, we do have a lot of fun. Yeah, there's an interesting one. Someone said Liz was a fence sitter. To be frank, I reckon she was smart. You know what I mean? <laughs> She's like Switzerland, darling. You just don't get involved with the drama. Sit on that fence. I, think oh, I love a wise, it. A wise position. Do you know, when we first started, we had a couple of um, women who were on parole come and chat to us. And uh, I re distinctly remember one of them was in for what they call white collar crimes. So for some sort of fraud or I'm not sure what it was. They wouldn't actually tell us what they were in for. So like nonviolent? Is that yeah. typically what that is there? He was. And then there was one who was in for... Uh, Assault, I think, or mans oh, manslaughter. It may, it may be manslaughter. And the third lady wouldn't divulge, which was absolutely her call, fair enough. Um, but she, the, I remember one woman who was in for, you know, fraud or something, and she said she spent the first 10 days trying to get her cell, and then the rest of the time she would just go around the prison with her back to the wall. She was so fucking terrified. Oh, I swore, pardon me for swearing. <laughs> They heard where some went worth. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Nothing new one went worth. Wow. So yeah, yeah I remember a lot of a lot of the cast has said that they visited prisons or they've had to do research to see what it was like in real prisons to see if there were top dogs and stuff. I remember um I know Tammy said something in LA that there were like three top dogs at one of the prisons or multiple top dogs. Yeah. Were, there were so she a group of them went when I think some of the new cast started might have been the beginning of series six. Um, a few of them went. I actually never went. I, I didn't go. I'm not sure why. I think I just I did. You know, either here nor there. I just never really got the chance to. I suppose. But yeah, Tammy went with a couple. I think it was Kate Jenko and um, might have been Rady and Leah. I think um, and. Yeah, she went to one and you know what? The governor there said that she thought the show was pretty accurate. And the hmm. late that was happening in that prison was people were getting sugar, stockpiling sugar, putting it in the bottom of a 
cup pour, pouring boiling water, just enough to make it a kind of gelatinous, boiling hot mess and throwing it at people who clearly they didn't like. So that was wow. the latest form of kind of payback, I guess. Um, yeah, you know, she said there are a couple of top dogs. So, and I think as is true for the world of Wentworth, there is a sense that the governor or governess, or maybe it's a generic term, uh, usually uh, is fairly close with them just to make sure they know what's going on. It's an extraordinary mm. world. I mean, we had days of filming where you would really, when you finished at the end of the day, you would feel like you'd been in prison all day. So the set, yeah. sets are so realistic and um, mm -hmm. the feeling great extras we've had some wonderful extras we've some of them have been there from day one you know so, yeah well that's a cute one what was the best practical joke anyone played i don't know you know what i don't think we played that many jokes well robbie's a jokester isn't he oh he is look robbie <laughs> oh my god yes i've Robbie's heard i've robbie. heard some things about robbie <laughs> There was one, and I, I'm so vague, I can't remember what episode it was. But basically, there was a dead body on a gurney that was coming through the prison yard, um, through the yard that has the cafeteria in it, the, the sort of the outdoor cafe thing, the commissary yard, I think they call it. What do they call it? The com yard, something. God, it's, it's over a year and a half, Kiana. It's a long time ago. Anyway, Robbie got someone to lie on the gurney under this big blue cloth. So we thought it was a dead body. It was just basically a, a, um, it was meant to be a dummy. A dummy, yeah. He wheeled it through in front of all of us. We're looking through the, the rain wire. We are looking, we're looking through the thing, watching this dead body go past. I can't even remember what character that was. And he bloody, he got someone in and they sat up. <laughs> so oh, they, my gosh. Dead body, this, and we're being really serious, and as you would, commissary, thank you, yes, commissary. And um, he did, yes, yeah, so that was a that was a good one, but oh, yeah, I suppose there were, there probably were. We just can't. Oh, I tell you what, I'm dobbing in Danielle Cormack, Danielle, I'm calling you out, girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> she was in the first three series, she was shocking at eating the food on set. So we would be in the prison cells and the art department went above and beyond to create a real world. As you know, like when you watch it and Boomer's cell is different to Liz's cell and Liz has got all the, you know, um, crocheted blankets and things. Anyway, there was always a little bit of food to nibble on, particularly in Danielle's cell, B's cell. B had a lot of food and Boomer had a lot of food in her cell. It was set dressing, right? But everything was still edible and they would <laughs> so they were real monte carlos well yeah sometimes there were but also <laughs> um there were these little packets of chips and crisps and danielle would be getting in there oh my god we ate so much stuff and one day i think there was a thing of chocolate bullets Chris, chocolate coated lip. yeah anyway funny we had some fun times very funny yeah monte carlo i monte carlo is nice as boomer states the Monte Carlo is an interesting experience. It's very rich. So it's got sort of the top and the bottom and inside is like a fake cream with strawberry through it. So if you're into creamy strawberry, that's, that'd be good. But I'm a bit of a chocolate girl, so that's my thing. Yeah, I know <clears throat> the, the Vegemite, Vegemite was an interesting experience for me when oh. I came out there. Oh, I bet, darling. It's a it looked like chocolate, but it was not chocolate. Oh my God, it's so bitter, yeah? It's like yes. it's, it's high in vitamin B, I think. It's got quite a bitter taste. Someone asked, because this is true, I ate four hot dogs once when we're doing a dining room scene. This was early on when I hadn't figured out that you never eat in shot, just pretend to eat or just fiddle with your food or drink a drink uh, because I, <laughs> I ate, I had to keep eating hot dogs. And then, you know, I started out eating them because they taste nice. And our beautiful um, standby props head of department, Paris, he's a gorgeous guy, he said, oh, do you, you know, I'd say, Paris, can I have another one? Because they're really yummy. And it was just 
for lunch break. <laughs> four or five hot dogs. Some days you just had to do what you had to do to get through. <laughs> but anyway. Let me see. There's a there's a bunch of good questions on here, but I want to see if we yeah. can get to like one or two of them. Here's one. one oh, Here's, just, I love this question. It always everybody asks this question, but this is from Ashley from Florida. Aside yeah. from Liz, what character would you have liked to play and why? Look, I'm going to go against <clears throat> the brain here because I do believe a lot of people say, oh, the freak. I, I would have liked to have played Vera. I think Vera, beautiful case. I think that character's had a really interesting low burn journey and I would have liked to have played a guard Right, you know, if I got my time again, because I can do different characters, I could come back as a guard. <laughs> I, I think yeah. I need to play a guard. Um, that would be fun. Was it hard to play a drunk person? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, I remember now. In LA, you demonstrated the drunk I, scene. Brilliant. I, I did do that. If Brilliant. Yeah, yeah, but I won't you, be doing. I won't be doing drunk imitations now, Kiana. Why is it too early in the morning? Are you, what's in the tea? What's in the a tea or? I don't be at it. No. The funny thing is, I'm not a big drinker, and I never yeah. really have. I'm quite allergic. I have a very. Um, ever since I was a little kid, I'm 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 allergic to egg and peanut, animal fur, which is weird because we've got two cats. Um, there's a few food allergies and stuff, so. Um, Alcohol is a little bit of an allergen for me. I, I had a snotty nose and runny nose. But Did I, you do research on how to, I mean, obviously we've all had drinks before in our lives, but did you do any research on how to play that when you're not? Or? No, not really. For me, it started with a, a thing of, uh, for me, one of the factors was the thing you're looking at, you're not quite looking at it, and that was kind of useful. And then just a sort of looseness, you know, that you're trying to focus. Sort of. I, I see drunk Liz coming alive right now. <laughs> She's coming. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> um, yeah. So, but you know what? I think I said this in LA. It's always bugged me, and I, I'll have to get someone to explain. For years, people have said, "Oh, when." play drunk you've got to try and play someone trying to be sober and I'm like that just doesn't make sense to me doesn't make mm. sense I've known a drunk person unless there's a reason they're trying to be sober I've never known a drunk person to try and be sober they're just drunk so yeah doing but you've got this kind of disoriented thing so it's never made sense to me Oh, look at all those lovely comments. Oh, the hand puppet. The hand socks. Doreen. You know what? I'm going to claim that one. I'm pretty sure that was me. I'm pretty sure I made that up. That you came up with the whole Doreen, Doreen? Yeah, Doreen, I think. I'm pretty sure I put my hand in the sock and went, well, 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 yeah. <laughs> they were pretty good. lovely in those first three series when Liz was drinking. They would kind of let me, and I think, Katrina and I mucked around with that fat, fat ass baby. It was my idea to pop my pants out of the pockets. And so we, we got to play quite a bit, which was really great. Yeah. Yeah, when you're drunk, when your friends, you're fine. Yeah, that's true. Oh, I cried. Mm -hmm. And that was very sad. Yeah. yeah. There's so many amazing comments coming right now. I'm trying to keep up. <laughs> You're going to miss being on the show. I am. Look, that's a good question. Am I going to miss it? And, do you know, I've talked to Tammy a bit about this because, as you know, Tam left in CAS, left in C in EP4. It's really weird. Initially, it's really hard. And then um, you just get on with your life. And, and uh, Tammy and I are actually writing. We're trying to – we're structuring a television series. So that has been so fabulous. She is fabulous. She's, like – a sister from another mister, you know that saying? Um, and, uh, yeah, so I've been writing and stuff. But you do miss it. And I'll, I'll be, it'll be weird watching the new series. That'll be really weird. No, I didn't keep anything from set. No. No. Um, basement fire. 
Frankie and Bees on Baby Joshua. That was good. That was at the end of season three. I didn't have much to do. That was being Frankie with the heroes at the end of season three in the fire. Um, a mum figure on and off set. I think you'd have to ask the other cast, but probably. <laughs> I've got two beautiful daughters. I'm a bit of an old nana. <laughs> I pro oh, pardon me. I probably am a bit more like um, a mother than some of the others. I'm pretty sure somebody said that. That was in an interview somewhere. I think... Was it Jenko? Somebody yeah. asked who was the mom on set, and I'm pretty sure that it was you. Might have been me. Yeah. And someone just said, do I keep in touch with the cast? Yes, I do. I have – they are the most beautiful girls. The guys are great too, but the people I keep in touch with are Tammy, uh, Katrina Milosevic, Boomer, and Jackie Brennan, who plays uh, Linda Miles. Um, I, you know, will ring Kate – Atco and Jenko every now and then. But, yeah. Oh, and Danielle. Yeah, I see Danielle every now and then. But now we're in lockdown. But we buzz each other every now and then. And Nicole. I haven't seen Nicole in ages, but Nicole De Silva, beautiful um, Frankie. Yeah, we're still in touch. But, yeah, Tammy. Um, yeah, Tammy's prop Tammy and Katrina and Jackie are my go-to girls. Yeah. It's funny, isn't it? What other questions have you got, my darlings? You're answering all the ones that I got previously, so <laughs> I'm, scro I'm scrolling through here. I'm trying to find out. Oh, well, you – here's one, but you answered this a little bit. Future projects? Yeah. I know you said you and uh, Tammy are writing. We are. We are indeed. Um, we are writing, um, and that's a lot of fun. I have no idea about acting. I mean, I know – the Wentworth, like a lot of productions in Australia, are in lockdown as well. So the Wentworth cast are on hold at the moment. Um, there's not a lot of acting. Well, there is no acting work. But the great thing about writing is that you can do it anytime, anywhere. So Tammy and I are busy doing that. I have to say, I can't speak on behalf of Tammy, but we love doing it and We've got this great groove going on and um, I think the show is going to be really fantastic one day. Uh, I can't tell you anything about it. It's got to sort of stay top secret as such. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm acting, if it happens, it happens, but it's not really the top priority for me at the moment, which probably sounds a bit strange, doesn't it? But, yeah. Well, sure oh, my Someone's asked about my succulents. They're so good. Very good. <laughs> uh, I like this one. It's a little more serious. But if you could change one thing about Liz or her story, what would it have been? By Alicia D. Oh, wow. You know That's a good what? One. Yeah, I reckon... Um, I reckon probably... Um, Oh, this is just, this is because I enjoy really enjoyed working with Steve Bastoni who played Dirty Don Kaplan. Um, I really liked the idea, and I pitched it to the writers that um, Don comes back, and he wasn't he he um, he comes back to collect these, but then he gets shot by one of Sonia's baddies. That was that was a storyline I thought could have been. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> It was nice. It was lovely working with Sigrid. We had some fun. She was so easy. Was she? Sonia. So easy. People were liking that you called her a fat cow. Fat cow? Sonia? You know That's what they said. Did they? Oh, really? See, my dementia is starting to bleed into real life. <laughs> a Bank said, I liked your line. Sonia's dead, you fat cow. Oh, yeah, that's right. When Boomer goes... Boomer comes to check on Liz's memory. That's right. And she tricks her. And then Liz goes, she's dead, you fat cow. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Now, there were some good memories. Um, yeah, what else can we talk about? What else can we say? There are other questions. Yeah, I'm going to try and get some more questions I, on here. I really like Kate's cooking with COVID. I think it's really funny. That's good. I shouldn't move, should I? Because it's going gonna, it's gonna to start stuffing around. <laughs> You're an amazing Why, thank you. Uh, isolation. Oh, yeah. How is it? Actually, someone asked before, what's it like in Australia? I think for us, 
luckily it's not as bad as it is in the US. The numbers aren't as bad. Yeah. Um, no, they're definitely not. The US is, is definitely bad, especially New York, like you said earlier. Um, I know I'm in Pennsylvania right now, and as of tomorrow, um, if you want to go into a grocery store or go into a business that's open, uh, you need to be wearing a mask. So not only have we been in like complete lockdown, um, all the main bit, like a lot of businesses are closed except for essential businesses like, uh, like food stores and stuff like that. But now they, they're requiring, they, they'll deny you entry if you don't have a mask on. Oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Makes sense. I mean, I think, I think New York's been particularly badly hit. And I, look, I think, unfortunately, what this virus is exposing is the diff different healthcare systems around the world and whether or not they were able to deal with such huge influx of really serious cases. I mean, no one could have been ready for that. And I just heard the other day that there's a bit of debate about Wuhan and whether or not they've actually been releasing the correct number around the deaths in Wuhan. So, yeah. So I think there's more to come. I mean, I think the impact politically and economically of this virus is going to be really interesting as well. Um, are my cats? Huge digression. Someone said, what are your cats' names? The boy cat is Dash and the girl cat is Mickey. There you go, and they're gorgeous. Yeah. What so, do you have a routine? Yeah, what's one thing that you did before heading to set to film a scene? I, I'm going to keep talking. I'm just pulling this blind up because I'm getting <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm, gonna, I'm pulling the blind up so now you're going to be able to see me better. Is that better? It's probably made no difference whatsoever. No, you're better. good. Okay. What was the question, darling, Kiana? Sorry. What's one thing that you did before heading a set? Did you have any routines from Gage Figueroa? No, you know what? It was different. Look, if it was a big emotional scene, I'd probably be a little bit more um, quiet and, uh, you know, sort of, um, yeah, a bit quieter and a bit more off to the side by myself, I think. Um, but no, I didn't really have any routine. I'm a meditator, so I try and do that twice a day for 20 minutes. So I do transcendental meditation. Um, I have been doing that for a long time, actually. And when my mum died at the beginning of 2015, I started that practice again. So that's probably one of the only things I do every day. Um, exercise, try and do a bit of exercise. Yeah. There's a fear. No, there wasn't anything particular. Hmm. Here's a here's an interesting one too. What would happen to Liz in the next season if she was alive? We had a lot of these like what if questions. Like what would you have liked? Uh, yeah. You know, if if that wasn't your ending, what ending would you have liked Liz to have? Yeah. See, that's a really good question because the dilemma was you can't really. She had the dementia, so the dementia is boomer calls. Um, I don't think there was much. More would have done one stage Katrina and I after I'd left we were sort of just riffing and saying well what would she have done if she could have what 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 would have happened and I said well maybe maybe she could have um had they might have we had this idea that they could have escaped together uh which is sort of unusual it's an interesting thought um that they could have gone out on the out into the wilderness and but maybe, you know, Liz would have died anyway. I don't know. I honestly don't know. But do you know, on a personal level, for me, um, I, um, I was ready to leave. Celia was ready to leave. Because the writing had been so consistent and creating this sort of downhill spiral for Liz that I kept thinking there's no real way we can shift that. Um, so I, but, but, you know, I knew I was cool with so, that. So you knew once she got dementia that it was on a pretty much unfortunate downhill spiral. Correct. And just give me a second, darling. I'm fitting my, um, sorry, sweetheart, you're going to hate this. I'm trying to, 
It just looks to me like the light's really dark here. See if this helps. I think it's because I'm really bright. I'm sitting under a light. Oh, is that what it is? So Maybe, just... yeah. I have a light on me. Dark. Maybe no. It's all good. Sorry, I'll stop fussing. Being such a <laughs> Wait, I thought you were looking for perfect light all week. I have been, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Celia messaged me earlier this week, guys, and said that she's she's currently looking for the best lighting in her house for this. Yeah, and look at it, it's bad. Uh, you know, <laughs> that question. I, yeah, look, I was really ready. I was ready to go. And um, at that stage, at the end of season seven, we did not know if the series was going to go again. And mm. I'd been told that it was. And then it was a little bit like, ooh, maybe it will go again. And right. I the writers originally wanted Liz to be there to the very, very, very end, but they wrote Liz in seven, I think, with a pretty clear tra trajectory that she was going to, that things weren't going to work out for her. And I was so exhausted. I mean, my big daughter was doing her final year of high school. I was coming down and back. It was time to go. And I felt like, oh, Liz has had such a great run. You know, mm -hmm. what else have you done with her? I mean, what else can you do? With dementia, like there's, you can't pretend there's a cure because there's not. So that wouldn't have been right. Um, and she probably would have just got worse, I think. So in a weird yeah. way. And I was pleased for Katrina that it gave Boomer the chance to um, experience lots of different stuff. Like with Liz gone, it, it threw Katrina and Boomer into a different uh, world. So yeah, we're going to get a different boomer. Yeah, you are. That's exactly right. Yeah, for That's sure. Really Here's, since you just said, like, everything that Liz has been through, this is from Rach Close, and it says, yeah. what was your favourite season? Because Liz was on it for seven seasons, so. You know what? I actually think season three, and that's that's a big thing to say, but there was something about season three for, for Liz that felt really, and I think it was when um, B had gotten out and was trying to seek revenge on um, what's his name for killing her daughter. And um, Brayden. Yeah. <laughs> I, got you, I got you on names, don't oh, worry. Oh, so good, darling. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that was something about season three liked and I think getting out for Liz getting out and seeing her oh hang on was that two maybe that was two that was the end of was that the end of two? Oh yeah you're right the end of two into three do you know what I can't say because I really liked season five and I really enjoyed the last season I can't say I haven't got it she's been yet. through a lot yeah, yeah. Was... you can tell look at me <laughs> <laughs> oh stop it I'm still Here. trying to get my life on track. But I am... that show has got such a powerful intensity to it. Working there, it's very, very draining. And I, I, yeah, we had a question about that. I can't, I can't find it right this second, but we did have a question about that. Um, a fan had asked, going into Wentworth, um, were you aware of the toll that it would take or, or the difficulty or, or just how much you're going to become immersed in that character. Yeah. Oh, really good question. No, I don't think any of us really did. Um, but it very soon became apparent um, <laughs> that it was going to be a high drama, uh, pretty bleak, physically uh, violent. Um, yeah. Scott just said he asked that. Thank you, Scott. That's a good question. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and I think, you know, when I, when I was out there in Australia briefly, uh, I visited the set and um, I spoke with Tammy shortly after and she had said, did, did you feel like it was a prison when you were there? And it's, it's very interesting because, yeah, it, it, the way that they design the set and the way they make it, it, it puts you right into character as soon as you walk in. You, you feel like you're in a prison. That's so true, Kiana. And I, I've tell a story about the first week for season one. We were given a tour of the set and I walked into the 
cell that was Liz's cell and the art department, my God, I'm singing their praises. All the crew were amazing. The art department had set up everybody's these personal touches about what they knew about the, the character. And I walked in and there were these really, there was a pin board with beautiful things on it that Liz had cut out and patterns of her crochet and her blankets. And I looked over and saw all her folded clothes. So they had uniforms folded up, bras and underpants and this tiny little space. And I started crying and I thought, oh, my God, of course, this is what prison is about. It's about, it's about withholding personal freedom, of course. Mm -hmm. that's the, it's a punitive punishing system. And I thought you can't have a glass of wine with your meal you can't go and have a good coffee. You can't wear what you want. You can't move where you want. Like it was, it really hit me in that moment, seeing that cell. And I yeah. thought well, that is, it's really, um, which sounds silly, but you, you get it, that the relationships are so intense because the world is so small. The relationships get this to them, I think. Yeah. yeah, I know. I know for me, when I walked in there, the first thing that I thought was cement walls everywhere. Yeah. You know, just dark. I mean, I know teal, but um, it just felt very, like you said, you're secluded. You don't have your freedom. And it's horrible. It's horrible, really. And I mean, after a big day of filming, you would leave and go, oh my God. I feel you just go home. I would jump into the shower and just shower for 10 minutes. Yeah. But, you know, the girls were great. Like Tammy and I, because we both had families back in Sydney because the show, as you know, is filmed in Melbourne. So we would chat a lot about um, we just support each other, all of them, Susie Porter, all of them are just gorgeous. And we'd often be on the phone checking in with each other because sometimes the content was really brutal. And mm -hmm. it did, you had to dig up your own personal reservoir of emotion to, um, to deliver. So, you know, that could be really hard. Yeah, most emotional, toughest scene. That's from Daryl in New York. Thanks for touching on emotion. Yeah, I think we mentioned this earlier when we were asking if it was the final scene with Boomer, but you said you thought maybe that was more what? hard, harder on Katrina than you, so. Yeah, I do. That's an interesting one. I actually think for me, the scene where Liz is in the showers and Boomer comes to get her or to say to her, I've realised you were the one that dogged on Sonia. And Liz goes into a psychotic episode and she pulls at her hair and that was that was very intense. And um, the crew that day was so amazing because I had to be on the floor and the beautiful camera guy was right there next to me. And it, it's very humbling, those, those scenes. That was probably one of the hardest. That yeah, was that was hard to watch. Because yeah. you finally saw her just break down and yeah. lose it. Yeah, it really was. And, you know, this is going to sound spooky, but there was a moment where I looked like my mother. Like there was a moment where I saw my beautiful mum and was like, oh, my God, that was, that was weird. That was weird watching it back because it was um, I was quite distressed for her, not for Celia, but I, I found that kind of oddly more distressing and harder than the than her death because i think for liz yeah. the death was actually a relief was a relief yeah i think i agree with you on that one too because once you said that obviously with the dementia and the stroke <laughs> yeah. it's a relief yeah 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 and you know i got so much beautiful um when we did the la con you know so many fans were really really beautiful and generous in, in telling me about their personal experiences with dementia. A few of them asked me about my own personal perspective on um, euthanasia and at what point does your quality of life diminish so badly and so such an extreme extent, at what point do you decide to take your own life? And they're, they're such big, interesting questions and I, I don't think there's any one answer. But certainly yeah. in terms of story, for Liz, it was the right thing, definitely, I think, for her. And, you know, the horror of locked-in syndrome, because I noticed someone else asked that, is, you know, when you do your research, it's just awful because they normally have to do what's called a tracheotomy. 
because they lose the capacity to breathe. So they have to put a tube, intubate and put a breathing tube in. And so, um, but you are, the brain is still functioning. You can still see and hear and you're understanding everything, but you cannot communicate. You can't move. You can't, all you can do is blink. And that noise that Liz has, which is quite harrowing, was the, is the only noise that you make, which is a kind of rattle that comes when you, you exhale. So, yeah, I think quality of life, Liz at that point is just um, needing relief, needing to, to go. And, she, and I think for Liz she also felt that she had closed things, particularly with her son. That scene was so hard. That scene was another one with the son. And he was such a beautiful young actor. And um, that was really tough. Say goodbye to your, your baby boy. God, you know, heaven forbid. And, you know, that today, I'm just thinking of all the coronavirus people living with and dealing with and those that died with coronavirus who couldn't see their family. And you can't be there. Yeah. That's I mean, a scary. That's... I mean, the uh, virus is frightening in its own, but to know, you know, if your son or mother or aunt or brother or whoever does get the virus and gets sick, you can't even visit. You can't um, even see them. You can't even say goodbye. Funerals right now, I, I know I, I have some friends who lost a lot of family. Luckily, I have not lost anybody close to me at this moment, but um, I know that there are people who are, are, are trying to plan funerals and they have to do like a drive-by funeral because you can't gather. And that's just so scary and so heartbreaking to know that this is happening. Terrible. It's absolutely terrible. I can't imagine. I mean, that's what I mean. I think politically, economically, but I think sort of emotionally and spiritually, the fallout of this virus is, is really going to be quite profound. And I think, you know, maybe people will start to sort of seek more um, emotional support I, I certainly hope so because I, I think the trauma to lose someone I read a story of a, a young woman in LA who has a beautiful daughter whose whose daughter was 12 and the husband went in with you know difficulty breathing I think it was in LA and um, she took him to the front of the hospital and said bye darling and then never saw him again and you know just no, your heart breaks. I mean, there's thousands of those stories. So we're living through it. As you say, we're all connected and we're living through it. And you just hope if there's some uh, way we can be gentler and kinder to each other. And it's tough. It's really tough for everybody. It, yeah, exactly. And like you said, we're, we're, we're going through this all together. So I think right now the best thing to do, like I know for myself, I'm staying home because of my mom. My mom has breathing problems. She's on an oxygen machine. So, you know, I don't, I want to be healthy for her just in case sure. I need sure. to be the caretaker and stuff like that. And I know a lot of people are staying home for their, for their grandparents and their moms and stuff like that. So I think, and like you said, you have asthma, so you're yeah. at risk too. You yeah. definitely want to make sure you're isolated and your family's isolated and we're all staying safe. Exactly. I mean, I wear a little mask when I go to the shops and, um, a lot of people in Australia, it's not. I mean, there's probably about a third of the people in the shops with masks. Some have gloves. Um, yeah, it's such a weird virus too. Like when you listen to different medical reports, <clears throat> they're still learning so much about it and it seems to manifest so differently in different people. That's what's mm -hmm. that well. Like there, do there doesn't seem to be, I mean, you know, we know that it seems in the respiratory system, but in some people it's, they're asymptomatic and other people they end up dying. I mean, and it does seem to be affecting um, elderly people more more um, commonly, <clears throat> seem to be dying from it, but I know it's, it is affecting younger people as well. Yeah. yeah. Terribly. Okay. Oh gosh. Hmm. Let's, let's get a little bright for the next, I think we have like maybe five or 10 more minutes, but what was yeah. your most funniest scene to do? Funniest? Um, Somebody just see. asked that. Who just asked that? Uh, you know, M. D. Stefano just asked that. Yeah, I really love the um, the stuff that was fun was when we were in H2 and uh, 
we were all collective. We were all together as a family and doing stuff as a family. Like there were quite a few scenes. I mean, a lot of people loved the scene where Liz was dancing with, um, uh, oh, my God. Jake? <laughs> oh, when you were, was this one? Jake, what is wrong with me? Was this one you were doing the tango, the tango? Yes, the tango. And then there were other scenes where um, you were just hanging out Family, like I remember in seasons one, two, and three, there were quite a few of those scenes. With that was when Frankie and B were still there. Those those scenes where we were allowed to be enjoying ourselves were a lot of fun because uh, they were moments of reprieve, moments of lightness from the darkness. You know, so that was mm -hmm. they were. They were really good. That was that was a lot of fun. There was, oh, no, we just, oh, look, Danielle and I used to carry on and muck around a lot. We used to do silly voices and different characters and we created these two old men, these two old men who would just kind of out-compete each other with how miserable their lives were and be like, excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> come in there, come in there, look. We do these stupid characters. And yeah, so there was a lot of a, a lot of um, silliness behind the scenes. Yeah. You wouldn't think that there was, and I think it was like a counterpoint to the content being so um, hard. And uh, no, there was a lot of love. I've got so many good memories, really, so many. It's it's an amazing. It was an amazing. I think I said to you, Kiana, in um, just chatting over Instagram, how. It's like a once in a lifetime experience. This show, mm -hmm. I, I really don't expect to have anything for that length of time as um, challenging, as rewarding, as difficult, as amazing. You know, you just yeah. those there with that roller fun. coaster. It's truly a roller coaster. Yeah, it really yeah. is. Yeah. Someone just pointed out your Big Ange impression. Oh, Big Ange. Oh, now bless Big Ange, the mob wives. She was a mob wife. She's, she's actually from, like, we're from the same hometown. Oh, my Staten God. Staten Island, New York. Yeah, oh, she had a little bar there when I was, yes. well, I want to say growing up, but when I was younger, uh, oh. she had a bar there called, was it Drunken Monkey or something like that? But that's where they filmed the show. Oh. And I'm, I've met her a couple of times. She was, she was a lovely person, I'm just, obviously. She, she passed away, yeah. She did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, you know, with her voice, you know, there was that, you kind of had that thing going on. I remember with Danielle, we'd do these voices. It's like, what the fuck are you doing? What the <laughs> hell? You don't fucking say that. What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> you know, we do these accents, run around. And... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love it. And that's no disrespect to that woman, but I don't know. We just, we were, you know, we were trying to make each other laugh. But yeah, we did some funny characters, and then we would eat. We would eat. <laughs> we, would, we would so much look forward to catering, like at lunchtime, and then you'd get wafts. You could smell the food coming from the the catering van, and you'd be like, "Oh, what do you reckon it is? What do you reckon it is today?" And you'd have little bets, fake bets, not real bets. But you'd take bets on, um, you know, what, what do you think you're having <laughs> for lunch? <laughs> and there were some favourites. We always had favourites. But, yeah, no, so such a great bunch of girls. I, I mean, I'm really intrigued to see what they do with these eight. Yeah. Um, and I think it's amazing. They've got Pam back as the freak. Um, no doubt that will create some... Um, you know, some interesting stuff. And they've got really good, really great movies too. So, yeah, it'll be really weird to be watching it and not be in it. Did you, Ashley Banks, I saw A Banks on here earlier. She asked, did you originally audition for Liz? Yes. Yeah, I was always yeah. auditioning for Liz. And I think I did three auditions. There was a lot. And one, it was really lovely. We had a chemistry test. They call it a chemistry test. And I think there was... Robbie Magasiva, who's Will, Nicole, who's Frankie, uh, myself, uh, Sharina Clanton, who's Doreen. Uh, I think Kate Atkinson might have been at the chemistry test as well. And we did this really weird scene. The director, lovely Kev Carlin, got us to do a 
improvised scene just to see how we all work together. But prior to that, I'd auditioned twice. So they were, they really, yeah, they really wanted to find the right people. So, yeah, it was great. It was so exciting. Well, I think they did because I can't imagine anybody else playing Liz. Oh, right, yeah. fans? You agree with that? I saw some people saying that earlier. But uh, so nice, yeah. It's interesting. I sometimes think who would, who else could I have played? I could probably. I would have been interesting to have played a real tough nut, like a real toughie. I, I think I could have done that. And I think maybe, I, maybe you would have came in as Rita. Oh yes, do an American accent, please. Well. <laughs> I'm not sure how good my American accent is. I think that's pretty bad. And I actually don't know where I'm from. Um, but I used to do a character who was kind of like, um, really sort of like that and really spoke like that. Cause I really think <laughs> sound, you know, that thing. And I'm not sure if that's like a Californian thing where it all goes like that. The and Valley so girl. Like, oh, maybe. Is that it? That's it. Valley. Girl. Your big Ange is like a really good New Yorker though. You got to say coffee and wash the car. We'll get a cup of coffee. Get a cup of coffee. We'll go and you know, <laughs> breeze. We shoot some people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think we're definitely, we're entertaining people right now. <laughs> right. Really like it's, it is. So that one is really like California and, you know, it really sort of, I just see this whole girl, I could see her <laughs> and, and like with a really big full trolley and she goes, <laughs> it's a different and, you know, I started to think maybe I should do like posts and just create <laughs> this, a fake. <laughs> All right, so Celia's next role is going to be here in America as a ballet girl on 90210, the remake. And uh... exactly, <laughs> a four-year-old ballet girl. <laughs> you can you can be a you can be a Californian mob wife. I could be, yes, it could be, darling. That's true, like a fake reality show. That's a good mm -hmm. idea. Actually. You've got. You're gonna start writing that. <laughs> 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 I love it. Yeah. All right, so we can wrap this up soon before they kick us off. But I want to know, um, I did have a couple of questions about what's in the future. Um, I know you're writing. Um, if you're going to watch Wentworth and all that good stuff, just to wrap it up. Definitely to wrap it up. Yes, I will be watching to support my girls and boys, but mostly the girls. Um, uh, writing at the moment has really taken my heart. It doesn't mean I won't act. I'd love acting if the right role came along. Uh, but I'm really, I'm really stick about our country at the moment. The arts are being slammed. We don't have the same support. In post about that, I think people are. Um, we're trying to share that as well and try to get the support. I know. You're tagging oh. your prime minister and stuff like that to try to get it, get his attention. So oh, nothing funny. on that yet. No, like, and it's such a huge profitable industry. Like, the yeah. art, entertainment, and events, and music, and dance, and drama, and television shows, and you know, we're such a small. We've only got twenty five and a half million people, so we kind of punch well above our weight creatively. And the fact that Wentworth has done so well around the world, like investing in our content is really, really important and crucial. So mm -hmm. as far as that goes, who, kno who knows if there'll be the roles? I mean, that's, that's what's hard. So for some extent, Tammy and I initially started writing this project for us to be in it. But interestingly, the more we write it, the less we want to be in it, the more we want to, the more we want to write it and direct it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, the biggest thing with what you touched on about not having the support for the arts is, is the situation we're in now that that's what everybody's turning to. We're all turning yeah. to the arts right now. Ooh, it's giving me a countdown, 25 seconds, but yes. we're all turning to the arts right now. We're all watching shows. We're all reading books. So you guys definitely need our support. So yeah. and we'll look, share that as much as we can. Yeah, before signing off, I want to thank you all for tuning in. Thank you so much, Kiana. It's been a thank joy. Thank you for coming on. See you. 
happy to do it. Um, love